Hi, I'm William Spaniel. Let's learn about international relations. Today's topic is the cult of the offensive and the origins of World War I. Now, unsurprisingly, the main topic or the big question for this video is going to be why did World War I start? Now, World War I has been the most studied war in the history of mankind, and so there are a large variety of explanations for this war, perhaps more explanations than any other war. But today we'll be focusing on just one, the cult of the offensive, which is one of the most popular and well-known of these theories. Now, if you recall back to a few videos ago, we talked about a trivial explanation when we were discussing the difference between proximate and underlying causes. And the trivial explanation or the proximate cause of World War I was that Franz Ferdinand was assassinated by Serbian nationalists on June 28, 1914. So let's look at a timeline of what happened here using this wonderful map that I found, which is public domain and therefore usable in this video. So Franz Ferdinand on June 28 was assassinated in Sarajevo. Back in the day, in 1914, Austria-Hungary was one unified empire and had one king. Franz Ferdinand was the heir apparent to this throne. However, there were Serbian nationalists who wanted to essentially unite a greater Yugoslavia under the Serbian banner. And part of this Serbian nationalist grand design included some territory within Austria-Hungary. And this caused conflict and eventually resulted in the heir apparent, Franz Ferdinand, being assassinated by these nationalists. Now, if the heir apparent of your throne were to be assassinated, you would be quite upset and you would issue demands and ultimatums out of the perpetrators of the crime. And in fact, that's exactly what Austria-Hungary did. However, Serbia did not meet these demands. And so a month later, after those demands were not met, met on July 28th, Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia. Now, at the time, Russia viewed Serbia as sort of a, a protector at some place that they sympathized with, and they knew that Serbia was a very weak country on the, the international realm, especially in comparison to such a strong empire like the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. And so Russia, upon hearing that Austria-Hungary was declaring war on Serbia, also on the same day mobilized against Austria-Hungary. A few days after that, on August 1st, Germany declared war on Russia. Germany had an alliance with Austria-Hungary, and so Germany was making good on that alliance and attacking Russia in response to Russia attacking Austria-Hungary. A day later, Germany then invaded Luxembourg. And this is where things start to get puzzling because, you know, you think about this, what the heck is Germany doing going westward? All of this had been taking place in Eastern Europe, and why now is Germany suddenly attack attacking Luxembourg? Well, Germany had anticipated that France would come to the aid of Russia, France and Russia and the United Kingdom all in an alliance together. And so Germany, figuring that Russia was going to, uh, sorry, Germany, de figuring that France was going to declare war on Germany in response to Germany declaring war on Russia, decided to preemptively start making moves against France. And so, in fact, the next day, after invading Luxembourg, Germany then declared war on both France and Belgium. A day after that, the United Kingdom, making good on its alliance with France and Russia, declared war on Germany. Two days after that, Austria-Hungary declared war on Russia, and Serbia declared war on Austria-Hungary. Five days after that, France declared war on Austria-Hungary. A day after that, the United Kingdom declared war on Austria-Hungary. Ten days after that, Austria-Hungary declared war on Belgium. A day after that, Japan, coming in all the way from the other side of the globe, declared war on Germany, and also declared war on Austria-Hungary two days after that. And then on November 1st, Russia declared war on the Ottoman Empire, and the United Kingdom and France followed suit on November 5th. So basically, to summarize things, one dude got assassinated, and then suddenly, boom, a big world war started within Europe all because of this one guy getting assassinated in Sarajevo by some Serbian nationalists. So the trivial explanation for this war, to summarize, is that the war started because a dude with a funny mustache died. But there's a lot of curious things going on here besides the fact that a guy got assassinated. Why are these states preemptively declaring war on one another? I think this is sort of a puzzle that we should really be able to explain. If we're going to actually understand why this war happened the way it happened, we need to be able to answer why these states are preemptively declaring war on one another. And the explanation that has become the most popular is this cult of the offensive. So at the time, military and political leaders believed that offense had an enormous advantage. There is some new military technology floating around, machine guns, chemical gas, and also railroads, which, while not being exclusively military in nature, also has quite a, a good use in actual fighting. Now, these military technologies had been around, but they'd never been fully explored in full-on combat. 
And so there was some uncertainty about what would happen in, in these wars if we use these new technologies. But the, polit- the military and political leaders at the time believed that this would heavily favor the offensive. So let's think about how this world would work in a strategic environment. So consider a world where there are just two states, and each of these states can adopt two strategies. They can either preempt or they can defend. Now, to rank the outcomes, I most prefer preempting while you are defending. This is going to result in me surprise attacking you, catching you off guard, and destroying you, and me being able to win a quick and cheap victory. My second best outcome is both of us defending. This just results in peace. Third best outcome is if we both preempt. This ends up in a war, which is very similar to peace, except now we're just all getting killed and and losing soldiers unnecessarily. My worst outcome, though, is for me to defend and for you to preempt because this makes me the sucker. I get destroyed and you achieve the quick and painless victory for yourself. So we made some assumptions here, and we should be curious about what these assumptions are going to buy us. If we make these assumptions, this set of assumptions that we see on the slide, what kind of outcome should we expect out of this? What are we buying with our assumptions? We can summarize all of this information into a game matrix, very similar to what we had seen in the last video. So this is going to be the cult of the offensive game. We have France going against Germany. France and Germany both can defend or preempt. You'll note that their best outcome, represented with the largest number three here, is for the country in question to preempt while their rival defends. So France is best off when it preempts and Germany defends. That gets with three for France. The next best outcome is for both of them to defend. That's the two. Next best outcome is for both of them to preempt and get into a war. That's worth a one. And then the worst outcome, the lowest number, is for France to defend and for Germany to preempt because this puts France in the sucker's position. So the numbers are very similar in Germany with the one thing being here is that they're flipped around here because this is the time where Germany is the sucker and this is the time where Germany is the quick victor. So if we have a world that looks like this, What's going to happen here? How can we figure out what's going to happen here? Well, we're going to use the same logic that we saw in The Prisoner's Dilemma. Let's look at each of these guys' strategies individually and see what we can reason based off of that. So first, let's put ourselves in France's shoes and suppose that France knew that Germany was going to defend. How should France respond? Well, France gets two for defending and three for preempting. Three is more than two. So in response to Germany defending, uh, France should go preempt and surprise attack Germany and get that quick victory. So in response to Germany defending, France preempts. Now flip it around here. Suppose that Germany preempts. What should France do? Well, if France defends, they get their suckers payoff. If they preempt, then at least they end up in this war while being costly is better than just being slaughtered. And so one is worth more than zero. France should preempt in response to Germany preempting. If we string those two pieces of information together, what do we get? Well, regardless of Germany's move, France is always better off preempting. Therefore, France is going to preempt. And we're going to see the exact same thing with Germany here, unsurprisingly, given the symmetry of the game. So if France were to defend and Germany knew that, then how should Germany respond? Well, Germany gets a three for surprising France, catching them off guard, and only a two for this peaceful defensive outcome. And that means Germany prefers preempting in response to France defending. And likewise down here, if France were to preempt, then Germany prefers this war outcome to the sucker's outcome. And so the one is greater than zero. Germany preempts in response to France preempting. That means Germany's strategy is that, well, regardless of France's move, Germany is always better off preempting. Therefore, Germany preempts. And so we end up with this outcome right here where both of them are preempting and they end up in this costly war, despite the fact that this defensive outcome, this peaceful outcome is better for both parties. The issue, of course, is that this is inherently unstable because Both of the sides are better off in response to knowing that the other one is going to defend to essentially betray the agreement and preempt instead and get that very nice surprise attack benefit and force the other guy to get the sucker's payoff. So you can see how this is very similar to the prisoner's dilemma. We just essentially changed the numbers around and we ended up with the same result where both of them end up in this bad, inefficient outcome, even though another outcome exists that's better for both parties than the outcome that actually occurs. So what have we concluded here? Well, First strikes provide a reasonable explanation for World War I. And we'll investigate in the next video how the prisoner's dilemma can be applied to tariff agreements, or lack of tariff agreements. And I hope you join me then. Take care. Bye.